Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Hope you've all had a, a good week. Those of you in education, I hope you've been refreshed by having a half-term week off. Pray that you go back to school with full energy and enthusiasm tomorrow. How many of the children here? Oh, they've all gone. So they've disappeared, but hopefully they're raring to go as well. Great. Um, if you've got a Bible, uh, digitally or a proper Bible made of paper, you might like to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. I want to read something from there this morning. If you go to the middle, if you're not sure where Ecclesiastes is, you've got Psalms, Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes is the next book of the Bible written by Solomon. I want to share with you this morning something I'm just calling Living Life to the Full with the subtext, Why Die Before Your Time? The Bible makes a universal promise that is irreversible and incumbent upon every human being. Simply this, each person is destined to die once, or as the James Bible puts it, it is appointed unto man or woman once to die. Now, I don't want to depress you this morning, but I want us just to understand what the Bible has to teach us. So in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, I'm going to read from verse 1, just a few verses out of here. This is Solomon writing. He says, A good reputation is more valuable than costly perfume, and the day you die is better than the day you were born. Better to spend time at funerals than at parties. After all, everyone dies, so the living should take this to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for sadness has a refining influence on us. A wise person thinks a lot about death, while a fool thinks only about having a good time. Do you feel depressed already? Let's go on. Sure, it'll get better. Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. A fool's laughter is quickly gone, like thorns crackling in a fire. This is also meaningless. Extortion turns wise people into fools and bribes corrupts the heart. Finishing is better than starting. Patience is better than pride. Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. Don't long for the good old days. This is not wise. Wisdom is better when you have money. Both are a benefit as you go through life. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything, but only wisdom can save your life. Accept the way God does things, for who can straighten what he has made crooked? Enjoy prosperity while you can, but when the hard times strike, realize that both come from God. Remember that nothing is certain in life. And then the next few verses I'm just putting on the screen. I have seen everything in this meaningless life, including the death of good young people and the long life of the wicked. So don't be too good or too wise. Why destroy yourself? On the other hand, don't be too wicked either. Don't be a fool. Why die before your time? Pay attention to these instructions for anyone who fears God will avoid both extremes. Dying before your time. Let me read you a list of a few famous people who we would naturally think probably died prematurely. Princess Diana, she was 36. John Lennon, he was 40. Amy Winehouse was 27. Robin Williams was 63. Steve Irwin was 44. Andy Gibb was 30. Peaches Geldof was 25. Steve Jobs was 56. Bob Marley was 36. Martin Luther King Jr. was 39. Anne Frank was just 15. George Gershwin was 38. Jane Austen was 41. Mozart was 35. Mendelssohn was 38. Chopin was 39. Schubert was 31. Tutankhamun was 18. We naturally recognize that there appears in life to be many people who would die before their time. 
And the Bible makes it very clear when it simply says, for everything there is a season, a time to be born and a time to die. Now, back in the Old Testament, in the early years of the priesthood, there was an old priest whose name was Eli. He was getting old, his eyes were getting dim, so he handed the responsibility of priesthood to his sons. But the Bible tells us that these two sons were scoundrels. They had no respect for the Lord. So God gave this message to Eli, and this is what God said. The time is coming when I will put an end to your family. So it will no longer serve me as priests. All the members of your family will die before their time. Now, let me just qualify something this morning, what I'm saying. We're not talking this morning about dying early because of an unexpected illness. We're not talking about dying because of an accident or God's sovereign will to take someone home to himself earlier than what we might think would be normal. Dying before your time is about a lifestyle that leads to premature death. That's what the Bible means when it says, don't die before your time. In other words, don't live a life that is without wisdom. Don't live a life that is without any common sense. Don't live a reckless life so that you end up dying before your time because your lifestyle has brought premature death. David said this in Psalm 55, but you, O God, will send the wicked down to the pit of destruction. Murderers and liars will die young. And Solomon, writing in the book of Proverbs, he said, fear of the Lord lengthens one's life, but the years of the wicked are cut short. So let me ask you a big question this morning. You've gone very quiet. If you were to die tonight, would you be ready to meet your maker? See, the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. So that whoever puts their faith and trust in him will not perish eternally, but have everlasting life. That is the message that GRN is seeking to send to every tribe and language and nation throughout the world. What an incredible ministry. And what a privilege we have to know that Sanjay and Mary are connected with this worldwide ministry that is seeking to share the good news that through Jesus, we don't have to fear death because the King is alive. We sang that song this morning, and every time we got to that line, the King is alive. You see, it was written by an American. They don't understand who the king is in the natural sense. When we sing the king is alive, you could think of Charles. So I was singing King Jesus is alive. Perhaps we can change the words. <laughs> because Jesus lives, we can live also. That is the message. That is the good news of the gospel. That's why God stepped into our world, because he wants us to have life and have it to the full and have it eternally. Outside of Jesus, there is no hope beyond death. Many people put off facing death. They live as if death will never, ever catch up with them. But I want to tell you, death is the great leveler. None of us can escape it. The Bible's right. It is appointed for every single person to one day die. So, this is what I want to share this morning. What will help us to not die before our time? I've been thinking about this, and the Bible just spoke very clearly to me of some areas that I'm going to share with you this morning. Okay, first of all, to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. That's what an Old Testament prophet said, Habakkuk. And Paul reiterates it in the book of Romans. Faith is about believing that the impossible is possible. Now, I just want you to watch the screen. I love J. John, and he illustrates this very well. So just watch the screen for a moment. 
there was a, a man who went for a, a walk with his dog and he got to a lake. He picked up a stick, he threw the stick into the lake. The dog walked on the water, picked up the stick, brought it back. He thought, no, no, I'm losing it, I'm losing it. And he thought, no, I know what I'll do. Tomorrow, I'll bring my neighbor. And then I'll have a witness. I'll have a witness. So the next day, he brings his neighbor with his dog, same lake, picks up a stick, throws the stick into the lake. The dog walked on the water, picked up the stick, brought it back. He turned around to his neighbor and said, did you notice anything unusual about my dog? He says, I did. He said, well, what did you notice? He said, your dog can't swim. <laughs> Do you know, I was a little bit like the neighbor. I was a little bit like the neighbor. I, I didn't believe in God. I was an agnostic. Do you know what the Latin is for agnostic? Ignoramus. <laughs> so I was pretty ignorant. I didn't believe, I didn't, but you know, my understanding of Christianity was a misunderstanding. And that is true for so many people today. Brilliant. You see, faith is about believing that the impossible is possible. And that's why so many people struggle to come and accept the Christian message of Jesus. Because they live with this kind of misunderstanding. Oh no, it can't be possible. It can't happen. You have to have faith to believe that there is a God. Many people deny the existence of God simply because they're not pre prepared to accept it by faith. And the Bible warns us when it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists. Now, we live in a world that says you only believe in what you can see. So evolutionists tell us that this and that happened 60 million years ago. And I get irritated when I hear these people trotting out these facts. Because I say to myself, you weren't there to say if it happened 60 million years ago. But they come up with this. And, and, and I have, I've discovered a poem when I was a teenager about evolution, and it goes like this. Once there was a polywog beginning to begin, then there was a slimy toad with his tail tucked in. Then there was a monkey up a banyan tree. Now I am a scientist with my PhD. Polywog? Slimy toad, monkey, now a man, glory be to nothing for such a planless plan. Now, don't be offended with me if you're a strong evolutionist. I believe in some aspects of evolution. But you see, when you take God out of the equation, you've got to come up with something else. And many people take God out of the equation because they cannot take a step of faith. The just shall live by faith. And if we want to know God, we have to believe that he exists. To me, it's easier to believe what the Bible says in the very opening statement of Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. None of us were there in the beginning. So you can say, well, 60 billion years, so-and-so happened, but unless you were there to prove it, you have no evidence. But as we accept what the Bible says, by faith, God, I accept you and I believe in you. And the moment you do that, that becomes life-giving. The just shall live by faith. You see, without faith, we live our lives like accidents going somewhere to happen. There's no purpose, there's no destiny, there's no certainty. Peter Light said a lot of good things last Sunday morning. Well, everything you said was good, Peter. But I wrote down something. This is what Peter said. God wants us to realize that we were born for a purpose. 
and a plan. Rick Warren picks up the same truth when he says, there is a God who made you for a reason and your life has profound meaning. We discover that meaning and purpose when we make God the reference point for our lives. And the Message Bible in Romans 12 verse 1 puts it like this, the only way to understand ourselves is by what God is and what he does for us. You see, our feeling world denies living by faith because it says unless you can see God, you can't believe that he's there. But Paul said that we live by believing and not by seeing. A friend of mine, Chris Halls, who was a fellow minister in Southampton for many years, he wrote a book called Jesus Reads the Psalms. And this is what he says, Inability to sense God's presence is not equivalent to his actual absence. Any more than being unable to see the sun on a cloudy day means that the sun has ceased to exist. God is with us, whether we sense him or not. Our feelings and attributes are not an accurate barometer for either his presence or his existence. Perhaps Jesus did not always feel God's presence. The spiritually mature learn to live by faith and not by feelings. Somebody Terry and Judy love to listen to is uh, John Lennox, mm, emeritus professor of mathematics at Oxford University. And he said this, faith is not a leap in the dark. It's the exact opposite. It's a commitment based on evidence. So I want to say to you this morning that your faith in God gives you life. It gives life meaning. It fills you with something. It gives you significance. It gives you destiny. Your faith in God is like a life-giving oxygen because the just will live by faith. But what else does the Bible teach us? Well, it also tells us that we are to live by the word of God. We live, we get life by living by God's word. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan in the wilderness, after fasting for 40 days, the Bible says he was hungry. And Satan comes to him and he simply says this, Jesus, if you are the son of God, then tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus replied, no, the scripture says, People do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, this is a life-giving principle. Do you read your Bible every day? When I was a child, I used to go to Sunday school. I used to sit on these little children's chairs. And my feet were not long enough to reach the floor, and so they would dangle. And we learned this song. Read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day. Oh, some of you oldies here. Why? And it goes on to say, if you want to grow, if you want to grow, read your Bible, pray every day. Do you know, I look at some Christians and I see them spiritually stunted. They've accepted Jesus as their saviour because maybe, well, I want a ticket to heaven. If I accept Jesus, then I'm okay. That's true. But this is my son, Andrew. Do you know there was a time when he was a little baby? I was there when he was born. Janice and I would be in a terrible state if he'd never grown, if she'd never fed him, if we'd never nurtured him and cared for him. But thankfully today, he's a man of nearly 50. And he's quite normal, he's quite natural, because he's, he's just grown like everybody else. Think of it spiritually. The word of God causes us to live and causes us to grow. And if your Christian experience, if your relationship with God is no different today than it was 12 months ago, there's something wrong. Because God's word gives us life, and if we don't feed upon it, we will not live.
Now, let me give you a context to what Jesus said here. Because Jesus says, the scripture says, let's get the context. The context was when the people of Israel were in the wilderness hungry. Interestingly, they spent 40 years going around in circles. Jesus spends 40 days in prayer and fasting. Similarities are quite interesting. But they moaned and complained on one occasion because there was no food. And Moses reminds them of that moment in their history. And he says this, remember how the Lord your God led you through the wilderness for these 40 years, humbling you and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would obey his commands. Yes, he humbled you by letting you go hungry and then feeding you with manna, a food previously unknown to you and your ancestors. He did it to teach you that people do not live by bread alone. Rather, we live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That context of what Jesus said is incredibly powerful. We grow when we live by the word of God. You see, when Jesus spoke of the word, he uses a Greek word, rima. There's logos for word in the Greek language and there's rima, you've probably heard it. Rima literally means what God is saying to you. Andrew, you're a fine young man. That was a Rima word I gave to him. It's the now word, what I've spoken to him. And Jesus said, we grow, we live by hearing what God is saying to us. And that's how Jesus lived. Jesus said in John 5, 19, I only do what I see the Father doing. Jesus lived out of that now revelation of what his Father God was saying and doing. And living in obedience to God's word gives health. There was a time when the people of Israel crossed the Red Sea, having come out of Egypt, and they came to a place called Marah, and there was no water. And they began to moan and complain. And later on, Moses reminds them of it, and he says this, it was there at Marah that the Lord set before them the following decree as a standard to test their faithfulness to him. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands, keeping all his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. We know that last line, don't we? I am the Lord who heals you. What's the context? If you obey me, if you listen to me, if you do what I tell you to do, if you live your life out of my word, you will have health because I am the God who heals you. You see, living out of the now revelation of what God is saying will lead to a life-giving relationship with God. God will speak out of the Bible. Every time you open your Bible, God is wanting to speak to you. Now, sometimes you'll read the Bible and you think, well, there's nothing wild that came to me this morning. But God speaks. Be open to hearing him as you read the word. God speaks through other people. God speaks sometimes in an audible voice. He will speak in your thinking by his spirit. He will speak through prophets and preachers. He will speak through circumstances. He will speak through creation. Imi reminded us this morning. She didn't really want to go out for a walk. But little Seth wanted to, so she gets up and goes out and suddenly begins to hear sounds of creation that she would have missed. God will speak to us through a myriad of ways. He is a God who has a voice and we need to hear what he's saying and live out of that relationship daily because it gives us life. Let me read you a story. Pete Gregg wrote a book some time ago called How to Hear God. I recommend it. It will bless you. It will help you. Because he's a great man of prayer and faith. Read your story. Longing to hear God and live. 
Ken Hessler made Jesus his Lord. He repented of his sins. He kicked drugs. He quit the band with its promise of fame and solemnly recommitted himself to be faithful to his wife and his two daughters. I began to discover, he says, that God has a voice in everything. A few years later, a retired school teacher by the name of Kermit, not the frog, but this school teacher by the name of Kermit came to Ken. They'd only met once before, but Kermit announced that he'd received a message from God and proceeded to describe an encounter with God that he'd had one evening while praying on the baseball field. The Lord had appeared to him and said, tell my servant Ken Hester that I have healed his seed. He's going to have a son who he will call Jonathan David. He'll play the harp and sing like an angel. He'll write prophetic songs for his generation and his music will go out over all the earth. What Kermit didn't know as he delivered the message was that Ken's wife, Linda, had cancer of the uterus. She was just two weeks away from having a scheduled hysterectomy, which was going to make conceiving another child medically impossible. Neither did he know that Ken was hiding a secret fear that he'd had for year, out of years of hard drug abuse that he believed had damaged his seed. He hadn't told Linda that this was the real reason why he'd always resisted the idea of having a third child. But now with his faith turbocharged, Ken rushed home to pray for Linda's healing before persuading their gynecologist to conduct just one more preoperative test, explaining that they had prayed. The results came back and the pathologist was baffled. In fact, he kept checking that he was really, it was really the same woman because there was no longer any sign of cancer. Jonathan David Hessler was born the following year, the fruit of a miracle attested by science and the promise of God. But growing up, he showed no interest at all in music. His sole obsession was sport. Wisely, Ken and Linda never put any pressure on him, never shared the details of Kermit's prophecy, and then at the age of 19, he finally asked his dad to teach him a few chords on the guitar. And he went off to train with Youth With A Mission in the UK at their base in Nuneaton. Today, Jonathan David Hessler's music with his wife, Melissa, truly circles the earth. Just as the prophet Kermit predicted all those years ago, in fact... I was with him, this is Pete Gregg saying, I was with him the day he heard the news that his song, Raise a Hallelujah, I didn't know Andrew was having it this morning, his song, Raise a Hallelujah, had reached number one on the airplay charts. And as for his award-winning anthem, No Longer Slaves, it contains some especially poignant lines from my mother's womb. You have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. God speaks. God speaks. And when we hear his word, it brings life in all its fullness. One last thing. So we live by faith. We live by the word of God. But also we need to live by being passionate about Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And Paul wrote that from a prison cell. His whole purpose and passion in life his whole reason for existence was Jesus. Nothing else mattered. Jesus was all that was worth living for. And last Sunday again, Peter said this, the devil wants you to lose your passion for Jesus. He does. A church without passion for the gospel will eventually 
die. A person without passion for Jesus will spiritually die. And that's the quest of Satan. He wants to pour cold water, as it were, on our passion. So my question is, what excites you? What gets you out of bed in the morning? What fills you with passion and zeal? What do you live for? Is it a nice bank balance? Is it a nice home? Is it a new car? Is it frequent holidays, career success, a happy retirement? You see, passion for Jesus dies when we live for worldly things. We were made for a purpose, an eternal purpose. And when you live for Jesus, you have life. You really do. Open Doors has a great ministry around the world with the persecuted church. And I read this just a few days ago as it was sent to us. A pastor whose name was Zachariah. He says, just after midnight on the 15th of May, 2023, my village was attacked by Faluni militants. Mangu is in the Plateau State in central Nigeria, a region increasingly experiencing violent jihadist attacks. More Christians are killed in Nigeria for their faith than the rest of the world combined. On that day, tragically, Pastor Zacharias's family were among the victims. He says, all I could see were burnt houses around, including my house, which was completely burned down with everything inside. He said, I searched to see if I could find my wife and children, only to find their lifeless bodies. My wife and I did everything together. We went out preaching together. We opened churches together. We walked hand in hand with each other that day. I cried like I've never cried before. And then this is what Pastor Zachariah says. My prayer is that we should rely on God because he is everything we live for. He is everything we live for. What do you live for? Can you say with Paul, for me to live is Jesus? You see, when you're signed up to that, when that's your passion, it is life-giving. You live life to the full when Jesus is the center of all that you seek to be and all that you want to do. So as I end this morning, if you don't want to die before your time, then make sure of three things. That you live by faith in God that you live in obedience to his word, and that you live for Christ and his glory. Will you stand with me? I'd just like to pray for you before we close our service this morning. Jesus, it's been a privilege to be together as your body this morning. It's been great to worship you. It's been great to be reminded of those moments when we're in the battle that we can raise a hallelujah. That the greatest weapon we have in all of our troubles is to praise you, the living God. And we thank you that we have life by faith in you. That your word gives us life. That the passion that you've placed within us should be used for the glory of Jesus' name. And I simply pray this morning for every person here and those that will listen to this later that, Father, by your Holy Spirit, you will help us to live different lives in an unbelieving world. You will help us to live victorious lives in a defeated world. You will help us to live in a, a passionate life for Jesus in a world that searches for hope in all the wrong things. Father, we want to make a difference. We want to be those who live our lives to the full so that others look and say, I want the life that you've got. And we can have the joy of pointing them to Jesus. Father, empower us to that end by your spirit, we pray in the name of Jesus.